Great, so I think we can start. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this month's uh, um, panel discussion, which is, uh, as you know, uh, a series of uh, uh, panel. Can you please uh, mute your mic, Agustan? Great, thank you. Yeah, so it's a, a series of discussion about uh, uh, how to transition to net zero. So as you know, last time we had a discussion about uh, uh, one of the uh, potential carbon dioxide removal technologies such as biochar. And uh, uh, for today, we'd like to focus on uh, afforestation and uh, uh, its potential contribution to uh, net zero. So we have uh, two excellent speakers and experts on uh, uh, tree planting, ecosystem restoration in general. Uh, this is uh, Natalie Seddon, is Professor of Biodiversity at the University of Oxford and uh, is also founder of the uh, Natural Based Solution Initiative uh, at Oxford, uh, Oxford Base. And then we have Bonnie Varing, who is a senior lecturer at the uh, Grantham Institute uh, here at Imperial College. So uh, as a way to start, I'd uh, like to uh, start with uh, Nat, uh, that uh, will give us a little bit of framing uh, around uh, what do we mean with Natural Based Solution. Because we know that uh, there's been a lot of discussion and uh, natural based solutions are actually now becoming very popular, both in public and in policymakers. So, um, Natalie, just to yeah, give us, talk us a little bit through this solution, what they are, what their potential, and the controversy. Thank, thank you very much. It's lovely to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, we've already got some challenges put on the table um, in the fact that we've already that the the title of the seminar is um, you know the word afforestation is in there, but you've asked me to open with a description of nature based solutions, and so 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 I think trying to get our definitions in line and have some exploration around what we mean by these different terms um, that are increasingly appearing um, you know in policy documents and and so forth is a really really important thing um, and I would argue quite strongly that um, something like afforestation though is definitely a biological form of carbon sequestration in that it capitalizes on the process of photosynthesis it is more a um, it is not so much a nature-based solution which I would argue and we'll go on and talk a bit more detail are those interventions that support biodiversity and where possible you know are implemented by or in partnership with local communities be that farmers or indigenous peoples where relevant. But this is step back a bit and talk about what, what I understand um, to mean by a nature based solution. So there are a variety of definitions out there, but there was one that was recently agreed by the United Nations Environmental Assembly or rather, uh, the, uh, earlier this year, um, which is uh, very long, fairly involved, but has it been agreed as, as, as the definition by, you know, all these different environmental organizations. And that's, just, you know, that's a really good situation that we have that. But but I think we can really putting putting the definition more simply, we can say that, as is on the slide, nature based solutions involve working with enhancing nature as part of nature. And that's critical to address societal goals. Um, and they can be many, um, providing local benefits for biodiversity and people. And the words local there are very important, as I will as I will argue, and I think very germane to the discussion we're having this morning. I think this term, which is sort of you know, become incredibly uh, um, popular or had lots of global traction in recent years. And I'll show some evidence of that in, in a bit sort of has sort of emerged against the backdrop of sort of all this uh, understanding and knowledge that we have that we are failing to tackle the climate crisis. We're failing to tackle the biodiversity crisis and understanding that biodiversity loss and climate change are too deeply and intimately related global challenges. And in fact, that many of the global challenges that we face are all related to one another. They share drivers and so they share solutions. But, but stepping back again, it's like this concept emerges from knowledge, knowledge from, you know, a huge body of growing scientific, you know, st scientific studies, but also knowledge from practice that healthy, and that's the important word here, healthy biodiverse ecosystems support humans in multiple ways and vice versa. So this is a two way relationship that we have between people and nature. People are, of course, part of nature and we can work with and adaptively manage our ecosystems that can help them build their resilience while they are also providing us with all the things we need. You know, nature is our life support system. As I say, the concept recognises the shared drivers. We know that, you know, around, you know, the biggest driver of biodiversity loss 
on land is um, industrial agriculture, industrial, well, land use change generally, but particularly industrial animal agriculture. Meanwhile, ag you know, what happens on the land and emissions from the land is the second biggest source of greenhouse gas emissions. So theory, by protecting, restoring, sustainably managing our, our natural and semi-natural ecosystems and improving the management of our working lands can help us, you know, store carbon, reduce emissions. Um, whilst also enhancing sinks. And that's sort of at the core of this concept. But of course, the extent to which nature brings these benefits depends on how we design, implement, maintain, govern and finance nature-based solutions. So I think briefly, I'm not going to go through this one in detail, but I think it's true to say that nature-based solutions has found resonance as an umbrella term that has that embraces different concepts that involve working with nature for societal benefits, such as the ecosystem approach, ecological restoration, ecological engineering, agroecology, EBA, eco-DRR. I mean, there's a very long list of these green concepts. Now, some of these terms are defined based on their intended outcomes such as ecosystem-based adaptation or ecosystem-based disaster risk reduction, whilst others are defined by the specific actions that they involve, such as ecological restoration or green infrastructure. But of course, accordingly, these terms are not mutually exclusive and a single nature-based solution may qualify several of them. So, for example, the restoration of a, a coastal forest, a mangrove forest, may reduce coastal flooding locally and thereby qualify as ecosystem-based adaptation or ecosystem-based disaster risk reduction. But if it also increases carbon storage, which is very likely, it, it could be classified as a natural climate solution, which generally refers to the mitigation benefits of working with nature. Meanwhile, depending on the specific specific actions involved, such an intervention could also be, be termed ecological restoration. So I think, so I think what, um, in my view anyway, is that a major advantage of applying a, na a nature-based solutions concept is that it encourages recognition of a wider range of outcomes of a given intervention than these much more specific terms. So referring to a restoration project as an NBS rather than as an EBA or an NCS, sorry about the acronyms, but there are a lot of them to get your head around. But this avoids the implication that the sole purpose and outcome of a project is either storing carbon or reducing floods or landslides. So in other words, by you know considering the full range of possible beneficial outcomes, the nature-based solution concept, um, you know, avoids trade-offs between them, you know, avoids sort of negative outcomes of an intervention. You know, if you just design for carbon sequestration, you inevitably get, you know, that can inevitably cause harm for, say, um, well, all sorts of things. We can get into that uh, in subsequent um, in subsequent conversations. But um, it also helps practitioners to design and implement interventions so that nature can provide these multiple benefits and to manage the trade-offs. Um, so, you know, so as a result of growing evidence and awareness, we've got this, um, we've got, we've had global track, great global traction of, of the concept. So here we've got in A, we've got all the, um, the, the NDCs, so the nationally determined contributions associated with the, you know, produced by um, signatories of the Paris Agreement in their second iteration. Um, they included, and 105 of them included nature-based solutions with, with many of them actually, you know, specifically including the term itself. Meanwhile, we see, you know, in the, in the peer-reviewed literature, there has been a huge increase in the use of the term nature-based solution and indeed an increase in the use of the term natural climate solutions, the term that refers to the, you know, the mitigation benefits. So we've had this global traction, but whilst I just thought, um, you know, it was important just to provide a little bit of more recent context about how this is landing in the policy space. So despite the fact that, um, you know, many, there has been this broader uptake in the fine, you may well be aware of this, but in the final days of negotiations at COP26, the term nature-based solutions re was removed from the Glasgow Climate Pact, where it had been in three different places a few days earlier. And so what instead remained a commitment by the pact's 197 signat signatories was to recognise the critical role of protecting, conserving and restoring nature and ecosystems in delivering benefits for climate adaptation and mitigation whilst ensuring social and environmental safeguards. So you could say, well, nature based solutions is in there in all but name. But what COP26 revealed, um, and I guess what we'll be really talking about today, are the great tensions around the term nature-based solutions and how sort of biological forms of sequestration are included. And, and what we found is that there are these two starkly contrasting narratives about them. 
So, you know, on the one hand, you've got many organisations that are, you know, embracing nature based solutions as, you know, as, as being key to solving the climate crisis. Um, many nations, many grassroots, well, some nations, I should say, and many grassroots organisations have just dismissed it as a dangerous distraction from systemic change. And these contrasting narratives partly reflect uncertainties in the underlying evidence. But they partly reflect controversies about how nature based solutions are conceptualized and implemented. And there are major concerns that they're being used in greenwashing. In other words, those responsible for ongoing damage to the climate and the biosphere and the wealthy nations that subsidize them are investing in what they're calling a nature based solutions program without also doing everything they need, you know, what they everything they possibly could do to phase out fossil fuel use from their operations. So this is obviously a very dangerous situation. The science is very clear nature-based solutions are not an alternative to keeping fossil fuels in the ground and unless we do rapidly phase out fossil fuel use the resultant warming is going to turn the biosphere into a net source of greenhouse gases and then the other key problem is that um, you know there are serious concerns that projects mislabels as nature-based solutions often afforestation projects are involving land grabs and violations of human rights and or are causing that harm to biodiversity. I mean, just two examples here, but there are many of them around the world. These, One of these is in Cambodia, one in Uganda, both established in the name of carbon offsetting, both resulting in very poor social and ecological outcomes, as well as net losses of carbon from the ecosystem. So this is sort of when it can go wrong and why definitions are so important. And I'll stop speaking now. Hopefully that's provided a, a bit of an overview and, and stuff for us to get our teeth into in our discussion. So I'll stop sharing now. Thank you. Thank you, Nat. Perfect. I think that was the, the perfect framing for uh, for the discussion. And uh, well, I'll turn that then to, uh, to Bonnie, because uh, um, let's try to kind of like dip a little bit more like uh, let's dive in into, uh, for instance, afforestation or, or tree planting. Um, and try to understand exactly when we can consider this uh, like a natural-based solution or how can we actually do it right, what are the key principles that we should keep in mind in order to uh, make this a solution that could actually uh, contribute to climate change rather than damage it or uh, damage the ecosystems. So, uh, Bonnie, over to you. Thank you so much, um, both to Natalie for such a great um, framing of the issue and also to you all for being here. So um, my talk is going to be a little bit narrower in scope. I'm going to talk specifically about the degree of climate mitigation that we might be able to deliver through one particular type of nature-based solution that is forest restoration. So I'm going to attempt to answer three questions. First, how much carbon can we sequester out of the atmosphere with forests? Second, how should we go about forest restoration? And note that that is not synonymous with tree planting. But if we need to plant trees, and I'll talk about when and where we should do that, how should we go about that? So the first thing that I think uh, many people ask me when we're talking about uh, reforestation as a climate mitigation mechanism is how much of our emissions can they offset? And that's essentially asking how much carbon is in a tree. It is entirely dependent on the size of a tree, but if you were to just go outside, walk around your campus, if you see an English oak tree that's about 30 years old, so a foot in diameter, there's a rough equivalence between the carbon in that tree and what you individually would be responsible for as a passenger on two and a half New York to London round trip flights. So the scale of anthropogenic emissions is very large in comparison with the amount of carbon that can be captured in an individual tree. When you add up all of the places where forests could potentially grow, how much carbon does that amount to? So the answer that you get will vary depending on whom you ask, largely based on assumptions about how much land is available for planting. But um, to give you some ballpark figures, so the current forest today, all the forest that currently occupies the planet, contains about 1,500 gigatons of carbon. That includes the carbon in the trees and in the soils. And these forests already absorb about two gigatons of carbon per year from the atmosphere. If we use fairly conservative figures and we um, propose to regenerate forests in all of the places where they can and should grow, um, so areas that have been deforested in the past but have the potential to recover, 
we think we could sequester about 100 gigatons of carbon by the time those stands reach maturity. So we're talking about 100 gigatons over about 100 years. Now that's a lot of carbon, but it adds up to 10 years of emissions at current rates. So the 100 years that it would take us to reach those 100 gigatons um, would be offset by only 10 years of our current fossil fuel emissions level. So that speaks back to Natalie's point about the potential for um, creating um, the appearance that we can solve climate change with this silver bullet of reforestation when in fact, it's just going to be taking a small bite out of the overall emissions pie. The other thing that I want to emphasize um, and which I think needs to be mentioned every time we talk about reforestation is the fact that it is even more important to protect the forests where they currently occur. That has to be our first priority. And there's several reasons for this. Some of them have to do with very complex global carbon cycle feedbacks. But a more intuitive reason is the fact that old forests can become very carbon dense and it simply takes too much time to reaccumulate those stocks of carbon. So the picture I'm showing you here is my graduate student, Jessica Murray, and she is measuring carbon flux out of soil, but she's not on the ground. She's actually a hundred feet in the air. What you're looking at here is soil that has accumulated on the branch of a very large tropical tree. These tropical trees get so big that they support communities of other plants called epiphytes on their branches. Those epiphytes, when they die and decompose, form a layer of soil. So you have essentially a second ecosystem suspended in the air. And work by other groups has shown that it takes multiple centuries for this feature of the ecosystem to emerge. There was a recent analysis trying to quantify the amount of irrecoverable carbon in land ecosystems. Now by irrecoverable, they meant carbon stocks that if lost today could not be replaced on a time frame relevant to our climate mitigation goals. And so they estimated there's about 260 gigatons of carbon that are irrecoverable in present day ecosystems. That's almost equivalent to the total amount of carbon that humans have ever emitted. Okay, so we have to protect forests. And if we look um, at forests as a climate mitigation tool, there's a broad spectrum of strategies that we can use to ensure that atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations stay as low as possible. I've talked about conservation. There's also options to better manage forests for timber. But if we're creating new forests, there is also a spectrum of strategies ranging from natural regeneration, also known as passive restoration, to active restoration. Passive restoration means we simply remove whatever the um, perturbation is that has taken the trees away. So we could be stopping logging or we could be removing big herbivores like cattle that are preventing regeneration. Step back, let nature do its work. On the other end of the spectrum is active restoration techniques. That's things like direct tree planting where we go in and put trees where we want them to be. Now what this schematic is showing is that each of these techniques have different monetary costs different capacities to remove CO2, different biodiversity benefits, and different social benefits. So relating to the bigger context that Natalie was talking about. I want to talk specifically about the contrast between active and passive restoration, that is tree planting versus letting the forest come back by itself. We do have to plant trees in some specific areas that are extremely degraded, places like former mining sites. But most forests that might recover over the next century are going to be recovering on degraded agricultural land. And this is a recent study looking at the rate of uh, biogeochemical recovery, carbon accumulation in forests that were actively and passively regenerated. And what the figure is telling us is that there's not really a big difference in terms of outcome between these two techniques, specifically on agricultural land. So there's not necessarily a benefit to directly planting trees. One thing that I also think gets missed from the conversation though is why people choose to plant trees may not have to do with the actual ecological attributes of the site. Many of these um, nature-based climate solutions projects are being funded through voluntary carbon markets. And what really guides those markets is monitoring, reporting, and verification, being able to report back hard numbers about carbon accumulation over time. And it's easier to do that if if you have a clear baseline, so you're starting in a site with no trees and you are planting trees for which you have a fairly good idea of their growth rate. Natural regeneration is messy. Often you're starting with a site that still has remaining trees in it, 
you don't know which trees are going to recruit to the site and it can take uh, slightly longer to get going. So many projects funded by these voluntary markets pivot away from natural regeneration and towards planting. There is even some um, language in the guidance that many corporate bodies use to guide their net zero efforts that specifically recommends against avoided deforestation because as it shows here, only projects with ongoing storage and monitoring, afforestation and reforestation can count. Now this neglects the science that tells us that forests that already exist continue to take up carbon from the atmosphere, so they do have ongoing storage. But this type of language creates a perception that there's risk associated with more of the passive strategies um, to allow forests to regrow and directs effort towards direct planting. If we do have to plant, um, there are ways that we can do it to ensure that the potential negative side effects of planting are not realized. Um, so the dictum that I have heard um, in projects all over the world is that we want the right tree in the right place, and that's very true. The right tree usually means some tree native to the ecosystem. Frequently, it can mean planting a mixture of species rather than a single species, which is good for uh, biodiversity. In terms of the right place, we want to avoid planting trees where they shouldn't be, because this not only has huge biodiversity implications, it has climate implications too. For instance, here in the UK, in the 80s and 90s, there was a big program to plant trees on peatland. To do that, they had to drain the peats. Those ecosystems have lost more carbon from those degraded peats than they've uh, captured in the trees. If you're planting in the tundra, for instance, um, you change the albedo or reflectance of the ecosystem during the periods of year when it's covered with snow, and you could get local warming because trees are taller and darker than the native vegetation. The other big challenge with tree planting is the fact that it is not enough just to plant. Uh, tree seedlings planted into the ground are like little babies. They need care. They can't survive without some degree of protection in their earliest stages. But this usually isn't provided and only 5% of projects mention monitoring survival whatsoever. This is outside the commercial forestry sector, of course, where the protocols are much better developed. But as far as we know, for these types of projects carried out in order to produce a sort of permanent forest intended to continue sequestering that carbon in perpetuity, we have very little capacity to monitor. There is also some contention that when we plant forests, they will ultimately store less carbon than naturally regenerating forests would. Um, this figure here is from an article from Simon Lewis and colleagues comparing carbon capture in naturally regenerated forest to plantation forest. And they concluded that natural forests store 40 times more carbon. Now, this exact number is going to depend on what they were using in comparison as a plantation. 96% of plantation forests globally today consist of just one species, have a single tree age. And that's because most of them, of course, are for commercial forestry. It might be possible to have more carbon dense plantations if they are optimized in such a way to have a diversity of different plant functional types or aged structures. But there is the very real possibility that planted forests ultimately will not achieve the same carbon densities as naturally regenerating ones. So to sum up, um, three important messages that I think can get lost in the uh, rush to plant trees is that conservation of the forests we have, whether they're old or young, is just as important as forest expansion. Forest regeneration is not synonymous with tree planting. There's many strategies we have that can be equally effective and critically less prone to stupid decisions by people. Um, nature generally makes pretty smart decisions. When we come in and start making a bunch of decisions about which trees to plant, their densities, et cetera, um, sometimes that can create more problems than it solves. And if we do have to plant trees, right tree, right place, and follow up. And so I'll end there. Great. <laughs> Many thanks, Moni. So, um, well, I mean, I think we got a little bit like a, a little bit a great overview of uh, the role of forest and uh, of ecosystem, especially with regard to uh, removing carbon uh, and then contributing to climate change. But uh, we also know that, as, as Natalie mentioned before, that uh, natural based solutions are also great for biodiversity conservation. And so uh, my question tonight is actually uh, what are actually the like how can we actually harness the benefits of natural based solution beyond carbon? Uh, 
Um, and the second question, which uh, maybe we didn't touch upon, is uh, related to that. Um, also, with regard to the synergies with the uh, emission reduction that are needed toward net zero, because uh, this is also a, an important uh, topic. So, um, how do we actually? Why do we actually need to? Uh, at the same time as you know, uh, restoring ecosystem, reduce the emission also with regard to the role of ecosystem in removing carbon. Okay, great. So, so the question is the question: Why we need to take biodiversity into account? Yeah. How do we do that, or both? Both. <laughs> okay. both, both. Yeah. I mean, I think. I think. Um, let me just start. What I, I will answer that question, but if I may, sort of just start with sort of the guidelines that are emerging around nature-based solutions and that are being integrated in. Very much a work in progress, but into standards around the voluntary carbon markets and and TNFD and all these other things. So let me just I'll just share a few more slides. Not too many, don't worry. Is that that's it there? And I will definitely answer your question. But I'm also going to um, really make a plea that we you know we we also talk about people and recognise that people are part of nature. People are on the ground in designing, implementing, mapping and monitoring and evaluating the outcomes of people on the ground are the ones that are being affected by these interventions. So it's we have to think about biodiversity we have to think about people. So I'm going to sort of unpack those a bit, if I may. And then I will also as we go through, I mean, at the end, I will also talk about sort of emerging technologies and and how we do how we do this, because the fear is often that, you know, people don't measure biodiversity because they think it's too hard to measure. And so it doesn't get measured. And this is sort of in the narratives. Oh, well, carbon's a molecule. It's easy to measure. Measure. It's not actually that easy to measure, but, um, and biodiversity is this multi-dimensional construct. It's sort of impossible to do it accurately, so we won't do it at all. So, I'll, I'll, if that's okay, um, Pierre, I'll do Absolutely. things in that order. But let's let's start with the guidelines, if I may, because it'll all sort of it'll all wrap up, wrap up um, as as I work through this. Um, so, I think you know, you know. Broadly speaking, in answer to your question, we have to recognise these other benefits and we have to ensure that interventions support biodiversity in people because we won't even get the carbon if we don't do that because it influences their permanence and their sustainability and so forth. So that's, I guess, an answer in a nutshell. But I think to address the issues around these pitfalls or around this sort of like the, the worries around land grabs and biodiversity and so forth, a growing number of organisations have developed or are developing um, guidance on what constitutes a successful sustainable nature-based solutions. Now, some of these are framed as policy guardrails um, for the uptake of the concept in an international climate policy. Um, others, you know, um, are more around evaluative standards for the investment planning and practice of nature-based solutions and in particular by that I mean the IUCN global standard for nature-based solution that the IUCN have pulled together and are really testing at the moment in the field but after a two-year consultation with practitioners and scientists and so forth um, so they're really interesting and it's important for that people know about that but at these these standards sort of converge on a key set of recommendations which we captured together with a large number of other organisations from the conservation development sector and research community, these sort of four overarching principles of successful, what makes a, a successful sustainable nature-based solution. And when we've sort of talked about, I mentioned briefly the first one, you know, they're an essential part of the climate solution, but not a substitute for rapid fossil fuel phase out. And we've just discussed why that might be. I mean, there are some analysis suggesting that the very most we could hope from nature-based solutions so not just forests but all ecosystems you know if we scale them up to the maximum extent possible we're looking at maybe 0.3 of a degree off peak warming right around to, towards the end of the century um, now 0.3 is significant but it's a lot smaller than what has to be achieved through the decarbonization of the economy and this is a this is kind of like the number one priority because we have to the number one guideline because we have to say do everything you can and invest in nature-based solutions no it's not an either or and we'll, we'll all of us need to keep, understand that and keep saying that as much as possible there's a huge misunderstanding about this but the second third and fourth will speak more to the integrity of the intervention and i think guideline two is important because we have heard a lot about forests and a lot of the you know, a lot of the emphasis when it comes to natural climate solutions, nature based solutions in general has been on forests. But we have to recognise that actually, you know, all ecosystems, all natural and semi natural ecosystems hold opportunities for nature based solutions to enhance the provision of a wide range of benefits for people um, and to support multiple challenges. 
So it's critical, we've said this already, critical that we avoid turning ecosystems from carbon sinks into carbon sources. Um, you know, <laughs> what tends is seeming to happen is that, you know, the protections of those old growth forests and, and other e important ecosystems, be the peatlands, kelp forests, seagrass, meadows, salt marshes, whatever they might be, are weakening all the time. And yeah, there's all this investment in, 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 in planting new trees. And these two things, as Bonnie has articulated really beautifully, are not equivalent. Um, you can't swap, swap one out and swap one in. It doesn't really work. Um, and some of this interest in so-called nature-based solutions is definitely distracting attention away from that fundamental need to protect what we've got, what's left. Um, and degradation of ecosystems, you know, to taking, you know, just fragmenting and increasing edge effects and so on, that, you know, that significantly reduces carbon so 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 storage and sequestration and increases vulnerability to climate hazards such as fire. Um, and as we've mentioned, you know, it's also really important to avoid tree planting on naturally open ecosystems, ecosystems that don't naturally um, have trees like native grasslands, savannas and peatlands, or, you know, we don't want to replace native forests with plantations. Um, so those things have been discussed. So, yeah, it's important to think that it's also important to remember our working lands. So enormous amounts of value can come from, as mentioned again by Bonnie, you know, I think, you know, what we do in our working lands, but also our seas and the marine and coastal ecosystems often get overlooked in narratives around nature based solutions. And yet those coastal ecosystems are incredibly important, both for sequestering and storing carbon, in particularly things like, you know, salt and mangroves, but also the other coastal ecosystems like salt marshes and kelp forests are also important. There's less less data but lots of work now looking at that but they also build resilience and, and reduce the impacts of the climate change that's locked into the system so those coastal and marine ecosystems incredibly important part of addressing both the drivers and consequences of climate change but let's talk a little bit about sort of guidelines three and four three is around people so this is that nature-based solutions must be designed implemented managed monitored by or in partnership with local communities that includes farmers, indigenous peoples, and so forth, through a process that respects their rights and their knowledge and generates those local benefits. So just a sort of couple of slides about, you know, why people are so important to successful nature-based solutions and why we have to make sure that the interventions respect them. For first of all, there's a, a material and developmental imperative, I'd say, you know, nature is the primary source of energy, food, and clean water for many people. You know, 1.2 billion people in the tropics are highly dependent on nature for their basic human needs. So you've got that high dependency. And those communities are also the most vulnerable to the impacts of environmental change in general. So there's this sort of material and, and development imperative there's also a moral imperative and an ethical imperative you know for many of us for many communities many people all humans i would argue nature has a very high cultural spiritual benefit that brings all these physical and mental health benefits you know much of which can't be captured by conventional economic valuations but what's it you know fundamentally important often that gets overlooked because it can't be measured yet it, yet it must be taken into account and then there's the practical imperative. Local people, particularly indigenous communities, but local people in general are the stewards of their land and they often have a rich knowledge of local ecosystems and their management. You know, which the knowledge that needs to be respected and tapped into and employed, particularly those communities that have been working with nature for millennia to, to work out how to adapt and deal with the impacts of climate change. There's lots of evidence that they're often the best custodians of biodiversity. We know that there are lower levels of biodiversity loss in the territories of indigenous communities around the world. So in other words, we're unlikely to succeed to implement and maintain nature-based solutions without the leadership and guidance of these people. And also, you know, there's lots of evidence that, um, you know, as the stewards of their lands, they often you know, have they, you know, they have that local knowledge, don't they? And they can be critical for adaptive management and, and also critical to ensure that the benefits from a particular in intervention have a more equitable distribution. And all these things are really important um, in terms of that sustainability piece. And I think just broadly, this speaks to the need in this whole realm to sort of shift the nature away, the narrative away from viewing nature as a resource for hum human exploitation to instead recognising our strong interdependencies with it and our, our origination from nature so it's all about connection with nature rather than nature as something to conquest which is sort of a meme that's dominated human behavior for a few hundred years um, and two key concepts which are not going in there but which are gaining traction are this idea of a social ecological system and we're moving away from the language around ecosystem services to a nature's contributions to people i think that's really important but on biodiversity which is what you actually asked me about but which i you know it's important not to overlook people so i'd like to put them in first before talking about biodiversity but of course, the degree to which 
um, you know, for nature based solutions to deliver sustained benefits to people, whether that's climate change mitigation or disaster risk reduction or food security, or whatever it is, ecosystems themselves have to be healthy and resilient. So their ecological functions need to be able to resist and recover from climate change. And so there's a good body of evidence now that the functional resilience of ecosystems is strongly influenced by the connectivity of them and or their genetic functional or species or phylogenetic richness. You know, so as well as being designed to provide benefits to people, nature based solutions must be designed to explicitly support biodiversity. So there's a foundational property of resilient nature. Um, and we know, yes, yeah, so in a nutshell, biodiversity underpins the health of ecosystems and secures the flow of the multiple benefits we derive from nature. So we really need to take ensure that interventions do support biodiversity. So we've sort of moved from this idea that biodiversity is just another ecosystem service. So this is the Millennium Ecosystem Service Assessment sort of figure that had biodiversity as a sort of supporting service to recognising that it is a foundational property of a nature based solution. And I think that's an important um, distinction to make. And I think in terms of your question about measurement, um, well, as I say, lots of it comes up a lot, even in sort of talks and, and discussions I've been having this week, this sort of idea, particularly in the in the corporate sector and also also in the public sector across the board, really, that biodiversity is so complex because it's this multidimensional um, feature as a property of nature that we won't measure it. And yet we're seeing, you know, that we're, it is complex to do it perfectly. But we do have increasingly sophisticated tools and we do have very good knowledge of many ecosystems around the world, increasingly powerful tools of measuring the microbial diversity of soils, because we need to think about biodiversity below ground as well as above ground. But we have methods for capturing that diversity within the soils. We know that the microbial health of the soils is an incredibly important part of the overall fertility, health and carbon sequestration potential of those soils. We have measure ways that we can do that. We have things like eDNA sampling, bioacoustics, multispectral, um, you know, remote earth, um, earth observation data and, and lots of work that's going on all over the world. Lots of new work in the UK where we're doing you know ground truthing of that um, earth observation data with really granular studies of species and genetic richness at different trophic levels within the ecosystem and we can ground truth that remote data and be able to sort of you know you know take it um, develop some really fairly robust um, metrics that can be used more broadly where there aren't resources to do that granular work. So I could say, yes, we can't do, you know, biodiversity assessment perfectly, but I would say the biodiversity science community has made some incredible progress into doing a really good job of estimating it. And, you know, so I, I don't think we've done, I think the human race and scientific endeavour has done much more complex things than doing a much, much better job of what, how currently biodiversity is being measured. And I think that that mess is something to get across. But I'm sure there are the many um, you know colleagues on the line who are biodiversity sciences, scientists and may have some you know pushback against what I've just said. But I think to this idea that it's too complex to measure so we won't measure it is not you know, doesn't align with where we're at with the scientific study of biodiversity. And these 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 worlds, the carbon world and the biodiversity science community need to make friends with one another and work together. And that is happening from place to place. OK, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Nat, and thank you, Ronnie. Yeah, um, uh, perfect. Also concluding message with regard to try to kind of like bridge the gap between uh, biodiversity crisis and uh, climate change crisis, which I mean, you also discuss a lot in, in your latest publication, and I completely agree. So with regard to that, actually, uh, I might have a question. Uh, well, the first question, and, and I with this, I also open the, the floor to the to question to the from the audience. So please uh, feel free to type it in the chat or just raise your hand and I'll give you uh, give you space. So um, that again talks about forest, forest management and also um, uh, yeah, with regard to, for instance, forest management, for, forest management and the synergies also with uh, some uh, technical solutions such as BEGS. So um, we know that, for instance, there are different level of uh, uh, managing forest, also harvesting, so extensive, intensive and so on. And we know that, for instance, extensive manage most of the time is the one that is seen as more benign because it's protecting the ecosystem and so on. But are there example or um, like, for instance, scenarios in which actually it's better to uh, uh, have more forests more intensively harvested. I'm thinking, for instance, of fire risk and, and so on. Uh, 
and actually um, it actually is better to uh, exploit the synergy with some other technologies such as for instance specs uh, because that would actually in the end maximize the uh, sequestration potential uh, overall rather than just simply leaving the forest as they stand because of uh, then fire might come and uh, disrupt the entire ecosystem and so on. So is there a, a place? My question is, is there a place between synergies between more technical solution and um, natural based solution? And do you think this is kind of like the way forward? I can speak to that unless Natalie you have a. No, you go first. I've got things to say, but please go first, Bonnie. OK. So some publications have shown that the total carbon drawdown potential of synergies between, let's say, commercial forestry and BEX um, can exceed those of natural forests. That is an analysis looking at, you know, gigatons of carbon absorbed per unit land area, not looking at the broader social and environmental benefits of an intervention. So just because you can move more carbon out of the atmosphere doesn't mean the biodiversity outcomes are better. And of course, in commercial forestry, they're usually not. Another thing that I would like to point out with some of those analyses is the conclusion that commercial forests are quote unquote better for carbon depends upon the assumption that you know some amount of that biomass might be diverted to BEX. But of course we don't currently have that technology nailed down either. So planting decisions might be made today and in the future the supposedly higher carbon capture potential doesn't get realized. I think the best approach is um, one that I've seen. We, at the landscape level, obviously we need forests for timber and we can think about how to optimize their management both to reduce risks like wildfire and to potentially gain these benefits and BEX down the line. But we also need forests that are just for forests and we need forests that produce things that people need other than timber. And so we kind of have to think not in terms of, you know, which strategy is best, but how do we balance these across the entire landscape so that we get permanent forests that do all the things that forests are going to do. And just just to add, every time every time Bonnie said forest, just remember <laughs> other ecosystems. This is all true of other ecosystems as well. Obviously, we're managing ecos, you know, forests for timber, but we'll also be increasingly managing, say, kelp forests for for and and, and other types of things that we need for for fuel and fiber. Um, so yes, no, I think I think Bonnie, you, you articulated all that brilliantly. I mean, I think yeah, just to reiterate, there's definitely you know, it's the time di dimension is really important. I mean, some of these technologies are going to be needed, but they are not yet ready to go to scale. And the trade-offs with land use that we need also for food production, yeah. as well as we need for biodiversity, for our resilience and other reasons are really quite severe. Um, and it is worrying that a lot of those IPCC scenarios assume, you know, the massive scaling up of tree planting in places where trees don't normally grow and backs when neither of them, we now, don't really now know how to do those things in a way that doesn't severely compromise our long term resilience by eroding biodiversity and by compromising food production. So I think clearly the future is going to be both green and grey. We're going to need both technology um, and nature based solutions, but nature based solutions are ready to go to scale now, whereas technology, maybe including for pulling greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere, might, might be ready by the end of the century or a little bit sooner, maybe. But what we do now with the land and how we treat our ecosystems is going to, you know, plays a massive role in, in whether we can even reach net zero. And we would argue we can't reach net zero without, you know, completely changing how we treat our lands and our seas. So that, um, yeah, those are just the things. But the other thing I wanted to mention is that, yeah, in a warming world, I mean, we don't really know how to do, and this is your much more your area of expertise, Bonnie, than mine, but this, this sort of idea of adaptive management is really, really important. So consequently, we're going to constantly have it having to work with ecosystems in a warming world. It's like that two way interaction I was talking about. And when we sort of when projects are sort of set up and invested in having that whole monitoring and evaluation framework implemented by local communities, sort of not sort of top down necessarily by scientists, but sort of like how healthy is this ecosystem, given that we're, you know, there's more droughts here or there's more floods here or there's more fire here and adaptively manage and, 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 and have to have, I guess, I don't know whether you, you agree, Bonnie, but sort of just thinking about restoration in a more experimental way, I guess, in the sense that you know, some stuff might not work 
you know, in, and, and that's OK as long as, you know, if we do a variety of things, a variety of experiments across the land, our landscapes and cityscapes, hopefully something will work and we'll learn from that. But having having that and that then becomes a little bit complicated when you interface with the investment community because they think, well, I'm not going to invest unless I know I'm going to get my carbon or my biodiversity credits out of this. You know, I'll say, well, you know, we need to, you know, put, put that for channel that funding to, you know, to a more experimental approach. Um, so that's that's the thing. And with the, then technology can help with that adaptive management process, assisted migration or all, all these other things um, have a role to play. Great. OK, so the key word is adaptive management. Uh, great. OK, so we have a bunch of questions. The first one, well, before I read the, the question from the chat. So, Thomas, you have your, your hand raised. Do you want to uh, ask your question directly? Yeah, thank you. Uh, both very much for the presentations it was really interesting. Um, Matt, I wanted to focus on that kind of point um, slide, which was around like your guidelines for success. Um, so I was at a kind of I was a, as a fly fly on the wall at a meeting about um, nature based solutions a couple of years ago with some conservation bingos, and they were really focused on nature based solutions to meet targets but really kind of paid lip service to some of the social justice issues I think because it's too complex and, and not really a priority for their funders. Um, what do you think are those practical steps or measures that are needed to ensure that nature-based solutions are adopted in a way that respects local rights and knowledge? Um, we know the kind of principles and the justifications but what are those actual kind of practical measures and how can they be scaled up and scaled up? I think all projects need to start. It's all very place based. It needs to start at the local level. You know, what problems are this community facing? Is it water shortages? Is it food shortages? Is it fiber? Is it, you know, is it jobs? Is it what is the problem that a local community faces? What are they doing about it? What knowledge do they have? what's working, what's not working, really start with that, because often we can come in and go, oh, you you must be, you must need, you, this must be your need, or this must be your problem, and this must be your solution. But actually, you know, in talking to, you know, in, indigenous communities and local communities, they're often like, well, no, this is the problem we're facing, and this is what we're doing about it. So farmers in Somerset who are restoring salt marshes, not because anyone's told them to do that or because anyone's helping them fund that, but because that's stopping their floods, their, their, their crops getting damaged during flooding. And so they're just getting on with it. So there, you know, whereas other communities and it's, so it's very much you start at the local level and, and there's lots of brilliant organisations and communities and individuals and farmers that are already doing a lot of really valuable things. And it's like, well, how can we build? How can we help you? Maybe we can't. We just go away. What, or do you need funding or do you need capacity or do you need knowledge or do you need to share knowledge with another community that's in a similar environment that might be coping with this stressful fire related, drought related, pest, new pest related problem, whatever it might be. But I think you have to start very, very local. And the, unfortunately, the way funding works, the way science is generally framed, it's all very much sort of looking for those silver bullets, looking for these sort of big top down things. And actually, everything is super place based and thus very complex but we shouldn't just like we shouldn't shy away from embracing the complexity that is biodiversity nor should we shy away from embracing the complexity which is humans <laughs> and uh, but we have to ask them first what what do you need and I and often they're already doing amazing things but they need a little bit more capacity to expand it so that's that's you know the, the local community indigenous people are fed up about saying you know, this is your problem and this is how you should solve it just not working so I think that's a key component of, of taking things to scale, which means working through local organisations, you know, working at a very, very local level. Um, yeah. OK, thanks. Great, Natalie. So, uh, Tilly, do you have a question? I see your hand raised. Hi there. Hi. Thank you both so much. That was really interesting. Um, I, I think I'd like to, to say something about commercial forestry, which I think is is a bit maligned these days. I think that commercial forestry has learned a lot about biodiversity crises. There's much more mixed plantings coming in. And I think that they're also not fully accounting for carbon in those systems because so much of it depends on what you do with the trees once they've come down. And unless you can account for that, you can't really make estimates because in, in a cropping system, you're trying to keep it at a kind of maximal production and maximal carbon absorption. And you're not allowing the system to get to a level where carbon absorption falls off. 
So that in that figure of Bonnie's, I was really shocked by the one tiny little square that represented the, the commercial forestry, because I think it's actually a lot, lot bigger than that. And that we need to be thinking very carefully about, certainly in the UK, our future forest industry and talking with the producers to, to so that they can understand what it is we're going to need in terms of timber crop, but also in terms of other services that their land needs to provide. There, there are many places in the world that make very, very good use of the timber crop and use it to build with and lock it down long term in really multifunctional ways. We don't have a cross laminate timber industry here. We don't have that going yet. And yet there are really, really good examples of that with long term carbon lockdown from commercially producing land that that we could be looking to and that this could be a much greater part of of a, of a carbon solution, but also well managed in mosaic fashion to a biodiversity solution. And I do think that's understood. Thanks, Tilly. I think you make a, a great point. And in commercial forestry, a lot of the benefits are indirect. So not just long lived wood products, but also avoided emissions from concrete, for instance, if you put the wood into a building. Um, but what needs to be part of that conversation, too, is just as Natalie was saying, you know, whether a commercial forest, uh, the carbon impact you get from that forest depends on local factors, the markets that that wood is going to, and how much of that wood ultimately ends up in a long-lived product. Here in the UK, we do a terrible job with that. You know, most of it is very short-lived products. And to get long-lived products, then you need sort of... Um, engineering innovation so that we can build more buildings with wood and have those buildings last a long time. So that's a whole other piece of the pie. But um, I think it's, as you say, you know, we, we can optimize carbon capture and biodiversity everywhere. And that includes in managed forests and in natural forests, but we just can't have just one kind. And just because we can show that through these indirect mechanisms, commercial forestry can sequester a lot of carbon doesn't mean that all our forests can be commercial forests, which I know you weren't saying. Um, <laughs> I know you weren't saying that at all. Um, but taken to the extreme, you do get people saying, well, you know, all our forests should be, um, you know, optimized to be felled at 40 years because that's peak carbon absorption rate. It's not about the rate, it's about the, the total amount of carbon that you pull out of the atmosphere. Okay, great. So uh, we have a, another question on the chat, uh, and perhaps this is for you, Nat. Uh, so there is uh, Riley that is asking about the role also of uh, aquatic ecosystems, um, which maybe we haven't talked about because we were focusing mainly on uh, on uh, on land-based ecosystems, actually. Um, and then, yeah, I, I mean, this is more of a technical question about uh, the um, where to plant in the, the right trees, and there is a method that is mentioning. So I, I don't know if Bonnie, you, you have time, if we have time to quickly touch upon that as well before we close. Okay. Right. So, so quickly, uh, here's a slide I prepared earlier on the, on the. I just saw your question in the chat, but maybe I should just show this slide. Um, it's, it's from a from a different talk, a lecture, but let me just share this because that is a big question. It is a, it is a hugely important question, isn't it? I mean, we. Um, I think first of all, it's important to say that we're in terms of oceanic ecosystems and that role in mitigation. There's a big a big question marks over that. Mm -hmm. But in terms of coastal ecosystems, you know, they're incredibly important, um, you know, salt marsh, particularly mangroves, but I think increasingly we understand that things like kelp forests are also very important for carbon sequestration and storage, and yet generally sort of a bit overlooked. Um, I mean, Bonnie will be able to correct me if I'm wrong, but I think some of the global estimates of mitigation potential do include mangroves, uh, at least. So they're including that critical ecosystem. But this is a, a paper that came out last year in Nature Climate Change by Bertram and colleagues that made these estimates, looked at mangroves, um, salt marshes and seagrass meadows and estimated um, that of the approximate sort of like, you know, 10 to, 50, 10 to 15 gigatons of carbon, that's carbon dioxide equivalent that can be uh, extracted per year from the atmosphere to the middle of the century, I think. Um, but again, you'll have to <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Bonnie, just thinking now, but it adds around one gigaton. So that's, that's. I think that answers your question. It's around about one mm -hmm. gigaton. So it's significant. Um, 
but it's but it's overall less than than the land. But of course, there's big, but there's are other are other coastal sea ecosystems that aren't included here, and there's the marine ecosystems. Um, but it varies. This this graphic shows that this varies regionally as well. I mean, we have to talk about these global estimates, but really we need to be thinking about regional. And you've got USA and Australia, massive coastlines, hugely important contribution to the the the, the, the contribution of uh, coastal ecosystems to to global mitigation. Um, but as it says here, the ocean the role of the oceanic system is very poorly understood and needs further research. So hopefully that's that's helped. I'll stop sharing. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot. I hope so. Um, great. So, uh, Bonnie, do, do you do you want to maybe I don't know. I mean, I guess in two minutes it's very difficult to talk about the methodology on uh, like go too much into details of this question. But I don't know if you want to briefly uh, touch upon the the question about the. I, I'm really not familiar with this method, but it's like the Mi, Miyawaki method. Or... Sure. So I'll, I'll take this just in a, in a more general context. Really great question. So for restoration, I mentioned the two endpoints, totally passive, just step back and do nothing, totally active, go in and plant trees, all sorts of stuff in the middle, like this method, densely planting in a clump. There's things called applied nucleation, which is basically making stepping stones of tree islands for animal dispersers to come in and fill in the rest. Our data on the relative efficacy of these methods, essentially non-existent, but it's a really exciting opportunity to figure that out at the same time that we do restore for so we know what works in what place. And that's like one of the coolest things about this issue coming to prominence now is all the opportunity we have to learn more about how ecosystems work. Okay. All right. Well, with that, uh, I'm afraid we, we need to, to close this session, although it was really, really interesting, especially uh, for me, uh, for, I guess, for also all non-experts on, 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 on this topic. Uh, so thank you very much, both uh, Nat and, and Bonnie, for participating to this session. And thank you all for, for being listening. Uh, just to, to close up, um, next week's seminar uh, is going to be from Professor Matthew Green, uh, who is a visiting uh, researcher at Imperial and he is coming from the Arizona State of University. Uh, thank you all for joining uh, and for your uh, interest. And uh, yeah, we hear from you very soon. Bye. <laughs>